Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. It's the job of the journalist to speak truth to power, but it can be a lonely place defying conventional wisdom and the powers that be. My guest today has known that loneliness. Irish journalist David Walsh was convinced that cycling's untouchable champion Lance Armstrong was a drugs cheat long before the sport revealed the scale of his deceit. Armstrong is now history, of course, but doping continues to devalue elite sport. Maybe it's a problem that no amount of truth-telling journalism can fix. David Walsh, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. I want you to, if you would, cast your mind back to starting out as a young journalist in Ireland working on sports. You memorably described yourself then as basically a fan with a typewriter. Do you still regard yourself as a fan? In certain respects, yes, but in a general sense, no. Uh, I think a journalist has to leave that behind. I mean. I think the predominant reason why people want to be sports writers is because they love sport. In my case it was, um, I, I mean I, I knew from a very early stage I wanted to be a sports writer and it was because I liked writing essays when I was in English class as a kid and I love sport and I put the two together and it, it equals sports reporter. Before we get to the state of sport today we must talk about Lance Armstrong and your Pursuit, and I think that's the right word. In fact, you used it as the subtitle of your book about the, him, The Seven Deadly Sins, and, and you talked about your pursuit of Lance, Lance Armstrong. Why did you turn it into a crusade, a mission, you against him? Well, that is how it turned out. I don't know if I consciously decided I'm going to dedicate all this time to pursuing one guy. I mean, the sport was dirty at the time. Lance was one of many riders who doped but they all didn't dope. There were plenty of guys who were clean and who got, com you know, completely betrayed by their sport. The reason why Lance became such, such an important figure was he was an emblem for what we were told was the change sport. He was this fantastically feel-good story. The guy who came back from cancer. Yeah, he almost died from testicular cancer. That's right. And then in 1999, he rode the tour again. He'd never won it before. That's right. But he rode it in 99. He won it. Went on to reel off seven victories. It was. Yeah. Perhaps the most heroic story in sport that anybody of my generation can ever remember. Yes. And you, more than anybody else, burst that bubble. Yeah. See, Greg LeMond, who'd, who'd, an American who'd won the Tour de France three times, said to me in the very early stage of kind of this investigation that I was conducting into Armstrong, he said, if this comeback from cancer is true, it's the greatest comeback in the history of sport. Hmm. And if it's not true, it's the greatest fraud. Now, as a journalist, you're thinking, if this is the greatest fraud and you believe it's the greatest fraud, you have an absolute responsibility to go after it and reveal it to be a fraud. You uh, came up against uh, an extremely powerful set of interests who did not want that story, your story, to be right. And I'm not just thinking about Lance Armstrong and his entourage and the US postal team that he represented, but I'm also thinking about the authorities in the sport because Lance Armstrong brought to cycling a sort of uh, a profile a standing in the world of sport which they couldn't find anywhere else so to trash his reputation was to trash the sport as a whole yes it was and it, it was to tr it was to trash a global icon I mean this is a guy who went on mountain bike rides with uh, President George W Bush this is a guy who was best friends with Matthew McConaughey the Hollywood actor this was a guy who who went way beyond his sport and who people around the world looked up to as some kind of savior he was he was fighting for cancer he'd come back from 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 kind of life-threatening cancer and and people you know every single person no matter where you live you knew somebody who had cancer you had a family relative 
and, and you were going out, you were buying Lance's book, you were saying, read this and find inspiration. How apprehensive were you about this, and let's use the word again, pursuit? Because, it, you know, the, the, the lawyers representing Armstrong were consistently on your case and the case of your newspaper, the Sunday Times. Yeah, that was, uh, that was kind of went from for about three years, 2004, 2005, 2006. And those years were dominated by meetings with lawyers and discussing the case, uh, a case that we were always going to lose because of the UK's draconian libel laws. Armstrong could never sue us in America. He could never sue us in France because in those countries, the burden of proof, it would have been on Armstrong to prove that I was lying. And I was never lying. But in this country, we had to prove that Armstrong was doping. And that was close to impossible. You got other cyclists to talk. And we now know that, as you've just said, that the, 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 the systematic doping was, was rife in many different teams. Many top cyclists were doing it. How did you break down the sort of wall of silence, the omerta, if you like, that there was at the top of elite cycling? Because I tried. And when you try to do, and I believe it was the right thing, I mean, I, I started with one, I exposed, you know, one key bit of information that Armstrong worked with the doping doctor. Simple question, why would a so-called clean rider work with the doping doctor? Armstrong dismissed that story. He said, I believe the doctor is an honest man. People accepted that. The doctor was due to stand trial two months after Armstrong said that for doping. He was convicted, eventually got off an appeal, statute of limitation again. But when people see you trying to do the right thing, they come forward. And I had Betsy Andrea, wife of Frankie, Lance's longtime t teammate. I had Emma O'Reilly, who'd been a personal, you know, masseuse to Lance when he won his first Tour de France. They came to me and they told me their story. Stephen Swart from New Zealand, he said, I rode with Lance. Lance was the biggest advocate of doping in our team. So I got three witnesses with first-hand evidence of Lance's doping. I put it all in a book with a very good French writer, Pierre Ballester, and I thought that was it. But Armstrong was too powerful. Even, even with all the evidence yeah. in the world, you couldn't bring him down. And it wasn't until five years ago that actually the US cycling uh, authorities, and, and then it moved on to the world doping authorities, but they finally revealed the truth of the scale of the doping that, that uh, Armstrong had been involved in. And in the end, he was banned from cycling, in fact, banned, I think, from all professional sport. I mean, he, he's finished, and obviously now he's way beyond the age where he could be a cyclist. But if you were to meet Lance Armstrong today, what would you say to him? Um, it, it's a question I've often considered. Um, I think I would want the conversation to be incredibly private. I wouldn't, want it, I wouldn't want it to be in any way used by Lance or anybody else for kind of, um, um, you know, PR purposes. But I would want to ask him about the people who knew, the people who still are, uh, have never been revealed as conspirators in what was a huge Because he's never told the, the full story. No, he's always said, I'm not going to be a rat. I'm not going to rat out the people you know, around me. Well, when, when, as a matter of, because the relationship between you and him, and goodness knows there's even a Hollywood movie that's built around this, the relationship between you and him is fascinating. When did you actually last see him and swap words with him? Well, uh, 2004 Tour de France. I'm at a press conference where um, the book has just come out. I'm sitting in the front row and he's asked about the book and he looks down at me and he says, Seems the esteem, esteemed author is here, I will answer this question. And he said, extraordinary accusations, as Mr. Wildshire and Mr. Ballester have made, must be followed by extraordinary proof. And there was a simple question here. Why should it be extraordinary proof for Lance Armstrong? But Lance was absolutely right. Ordinary proof didn't touch him. Mm. You need it. And in the end, what the United States Anti-Doping Agency got were 26 witnesses. 11 of them were former teammates, all with first-hand accounts of Lance doping. Do you in any way resent, I mean, it, it made, in a sense, it made your career, you know, journalists long to have that defining story that will win them awards, make Hollywood movies and everything else, and you, goodness knows, had that. But you also, and this is important, you, you found your life consumed by this. And at one point, I remember your daughter making a comment when she saw you interviewed on TV uh, about Lance. And she said, oh, there you go again, Dad. I'm watching you on telly while the rest of the family are having dinner. Same old, same old. You know, you sacrificed a lot for this. Yeah. Was it really worth it? Oh, it totally was worth it. And I never saw it as a sacrifice, Stephen. My feeling all the time was this was the most fun I was ever going to have as a journalist. I mean, people 
are always astounded when I say that. They say you were sued. You know, this guy won. He made your newspaper, cost your newspaper a million pounds. That must have been horrible. And your family. And I say, actually, it wasn't horrible. I really had a good time. I, I never felt more journalistically alive as I was during those years. And, and I know it's a, it's a preposterous kind of um, um, comparison because what happened with, with, with um, um, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward and Watergate was vastly bigger than Armstrong. But if you look at that movie, All the President's Men, what you see is two journalists on the case, mm. having the time of their lives, knowing there will never be another story like this on a much smaller scale. I had that feeling with Armstrong. Well, I can see that excitement shining in your eyes right now, but it forces me then to move the clock forward and to talk about the way you've conducted some of your journalism in more recent years, because you haven't left sports and you certainly haven't left cycling. You're still a, a very influential cycling journalist. Why, oh why? Having learned the lessons you learned from the Armstrong case, did you decide in more recent years to vouch for, in a really significant way, the, the honesty, the integrity, the credibility of the dominant cycling team of recent years, Team Sky, when so many other journalists were saying, hang on a minute, you can't be so sure that they're clean when cycling as a whole is still full of drugs. Why did you do that? I was offered the opportunity to spend 13 weeks inside Team Sky. I would spend as long as I liked and I choose to spend 13 weeks. People have weeks. called it an embed, almost like military journalists go with the army yeah. during a war. Yeah. You went to Team Sky and you lived with them, you ate with them, but frankly they were using you as a tool because they wanted to convince you that they were the new clean team. I think it's right to say that they use me, but I think you need to, in fairness to all the good people in Team Sky, because I believe about I think there's about 80, maybe 70, 80 people working in the team. I believe if you took four people out of that team and one of them is already gone, that you would have a very clean team. I was invited to go into that team by Dave Brailsford. There's no question he duped me. He, he duped you? He duped me. He, he is Sir Dave Brailsford now. He was knighted. If he had told me at the time he was inviting me into the team, by the way, just so you know the full picture, we gave a therapeutic use exemption to Bradley before the 2011 Tour de France. All right, we, we're going to have to hold up a little bit and just yeah. explain some of this for our audience because it's yeah. quite complicated. But the therapeutic exemption is a very important concept in professional cycling because it means that substances, drugs that are banned for riders can be given to riders as long as there's proof that there is a medical need. Yes. And, and uh, now we're talking about Bradley Wiggins, who won the Tour de France in 2012, but it turns out, we didn't know at the time, and you didn't know when you were embedded with Team Sky, but it turns out that in three of his most significant lifetime races, just before those races, he got these, these therapeutic exemptions, and he took a drug which could, in theory, have significantly enhanced his performance. Yes. And, and the thing about it is you can say, oh, you know, Brailsford duped you. He didn't tell you. But he actually duped lots of people inside his own team. Chris Froome, Bradley Wiggins' teammate, who finished second in the Tour de France, he had no idea that Bradley Wiggins was given these TUEs. Chris Froome has said... L let me just be clear. What yeah. Bradley Wiggins took, because he'd got the uh, therapeutic exemption, it was not in any way illegal or contrary to the rules of the sport. I think it's more correct to say it may not have been illegal. Because if you get a therapeutic use exemption by exaggerating your symptoms, that's not legal. Now, we don't know that. It may be that Bradley Wiggins was utterly entitled to get that TUE. That's the part we don't know. Would it have been different if Bradley Wiggins had, and the team had been entirely uh, transparent at the time and said, I am riding with this uh, therapeutic exemption drug in me because I've, I've taken it before the race because I had a problem and I've addressed that problem? Yeah, it would. Of course, that would have been much better, but, but they would have drawn huge criticism on themselves. People would have said, why did he need it four days before the race? And, and th there is a reason why they didn't tell people. They didn't tell Chris Froome. They didn't tell any other rider in the Team Sky. They didn't tell some of the doctors in the team didn't know about this. But it comes back, and we touched on this early in the conversation, with the degree to which you as a journalist have the right, without the most powerful evidence, to trash the reputations and careers of elite sports people. You, in the last, let's say, six months, have gone out and very consciously, if I may say so, trashed 
Bradley Wiggins. You've said that you don't want to hear any more about his 2012 Tour de France victory because in your view it's been completely devalued. You've said that as far as you're concerned, Bradley R R Wiggins' reputation has been lost. And yet, I come back to the point, the man has done nothing wrong in terms of the rules of his sport. <laughs> In terms of the rules of a sport, he certainly hasn't been sanctioned. I don't, uh, I don't accept the point that it's, that it's absolute that they didn't commit a doping infraction. I mean, there's a, there's a big investigation going on about a mysterious medical package that was delivered to Bradley Wiggins at a race in France in 2011. Sky have failed to say what was in that package. That could have been well, something, something that, that wasn't legal. If it, if, if it was legal, why didn't they tell us when we asked what was in the package? It took them so long to come out and tell us. But the, the point here is that, that you can say that I'm trashing him. Um, Team Sky's leading rider now, three-time winner of the Tour de France, has said that in his view, what happened with Bradley Wiggins was unethical I, I, and, and immoral. You're talking about Chris Froome? Yes. But in, 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 in a way, one of the most interesting things about this whole ethical, moral morass that you know, you, you've entered and been in for so long now is your decision to be so harsh on what we now know about Bradley, Bradley Wiggins, but still to maintain that as far as you are concerned and your personal knowledge of the man, that Chris Froome, the three-time Tour de France winner, in your view, is a man that you will always vouch for, you completely believe in his credibility and you will not countenance any questioning, which others do, of the legitimacy of his uh, race no, victories. No, I would never say I don't countenance questioning. Everybody has the right to question. That's what I do for a living. Why would I say somebody doesn't have the right to question? But you, you co-authored no, no. his book. I mean, yes, you have shaken yes. hands with the man. You have said to, to Chris Froome, I believe in you. What would, you. what would you like me to do? Would you like me to say, I really believe in Chris Froome, but it'd be prudent of me to just hedge my bets here. Just sit on the fence. That's not my nature. I'm not going to do it. It's exactly what some of the most experienced people in the business say you should have done. I'm thinking of Frankie Andreu, the writer that you've worked with to a certain extent as a source. Yep. He said, when it comes to Chris Froome, you have been naive. Why didn't you just stay neutral, he said to you a yep. while ago. Why say and vouch for the fact that he's clean when at some future point you might just look stupid if it turns out that he wasn't? Yeah, but I don't, I don't see my reputation as being, uh, being that relevant. What I see as being relevant is if I believe somebody is clean I'm not going to lie and say I don't believe he's clean I'm not going to say sit on the fence David because you never know what might happen in the future if you believe somebody is clean you owe it to that person to say it because if I didn't believe he was clean I would say the opposite so for me this idea of sitting on the fence is totally I understand unappealing. what you're saying but again just to, to pick away at this for one more moment on Chris Froome we know that he also used the therapeutic exemption yes. clause Act, actually in a race not not even yes. before a race but during a race he got a, yes. an exemption to take a drug which was on the banned list yes and yet you say that that's fundamentally different from Bradley Wiggins uh, you also say that you're partly convinced by Chris Froome because you had and this is in your book you, you had a, a, a very private one-on-one -on -one talk with him when he explained lots of things what what did he say to you that convinced you so much of his integrity well it, it, it wasn't just that but that was a moment where where I, and 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 by the way I, I've never you know gone let, yeah, let me maybe put that conversation first into the context I'm, I'm in a hotel and I'm walking up the fire escape and he's coming down and it's one of those stairways that there's nobody going to come you just know and he stopped and he said to me he said, I want to tell you one thing. And I said, I said, what's that, Chris? He said, I'm telling you now that as long as I live, um, what I've achieved in this race will never, it, it, the perception of it will never be changed by anything that's going to come out. But you know what? The crazy thing is Lance Armstrong would have looked you in the eye and said just the same thing if no, he'd met you on a fire scrape in 2001. He didn't. See, that's it, Stephen. I actually met Lance and I spoke to him. And we said, Lance, what about doping? This sport has got so much, you know, bad press. And here you are winning the Tour de France for the first time. And this is what Lance said. He said, look, I'm going to address this question once and once only. And I'm saying to you guys, you journalists, you've got to fall in love with cycling again. He never actually said, I would never dope. I do not dope. He said, I have tested positive. I have passed all the controls. Now, if you're covering the sport and if you're a sports writer and you see lots of this stuff, you actually know 
how to read what people are saying. And saying, I have passed all the tests, is not the same as saying, I don't dope. How can it be, and I want to broaden the conversation now, because cycling has been one of your key sort of focuses, but you've also looked at wider sport yeah. and drugs yeah. in professional elite sport as a whole. How can it be that after decades of focus on stamping out the illegal substances in sports, performance enhancing drugs, that here today we probably can say that there's more systematic use of performance enhancing drugs in athletics, in cycling, in other sports than there's ever been before? I don't think you can say that. Because what well, is Look it? at what we've learned about the Russians. Yes, systematic doping in Russia, but in the past there's been systematic doping in, in Russia. When the Russian systematic doping has been going on for at least 40 years, according to Professor Richard McLaren, who did the report. So it's not something new. Well, you've, not... you've worked in the recent past with, with uh, a former Russian anti-doping executive who blew the whistle on what was going on, plus his partner, who is a former elite athlete who did dope for a while. You've worked with them. They're now living in exile in the United States. And they have told you that it was industrial scale. Yes, of course. But going back for decades. But how come it can have been in the very recent past industrial scale when, as I made the point, you know, uh, the, the World Anti-Doping Agency, the IAAF and all of the other different world bodies supposed to be controlling drugs in sport have spent years telling us that they're cleaning it out. Well, the reason, the reason why Russia um, were able to get away with it, it was state-supported. And it's a big deal if you've got, if you've got the, the Ministry of Sport and the Anti-Doping Agency and the Anti-Doping Laboratory all conspiring to cheat. That gives the advantages and their coaches who are... Who are what, you're saying that men who claim to be on the side of the good guys, like Sebastian Coe, who now runs the IAAF, the athletics governing body, and indeed the World Anti-Doping Agency, you're saying that they either don't have the will or the capacity to take on state programs devoted to doping. Yeah, I, I, um, I, they, they definitely don't have the resources. Do they I have mean, the will? Um, I'm not sure. I think if they, if they were better resourced, they would have bigger staffs, they probably would have better people, and they would have better protocols. But the, the World Anti-Doping Agency, um, the former um, Director General David Howman, once said, he said, our annual budget is less than Wayne Rooney's annual wages. Now, that's what we put into anti-doping. The entire World Anti-Doping Agency budget for one year is less than one footballer, not even the highest paid footballer in the world, is less than his annual wages. That's what we think of doping. In other words, we're not concerned enough about doping to, to make a real impact. We, we're almost at the end. I want to start where I began, the idea of being a fan. You know what Dick Pound, the former chief of the World Anti-Doping Agency, said to me not long ago on Hard Talk? He said, when I watch particularly cycling today, I simply cannot bear to watch it anymore. I cannot take it seriously. He certainly cannot be a fan. How can you still be a fan, knowing yeah. what you know? Because, see, what, what Dick has said there is, is my definition of cynicism. Because that starts from the presumption that they're all cheating. Anyway, he and, called it realism. Well, he can, and I can call it cynicism. Because what happens if somebody who's clean is winning the Tour de France, but because you have a preconception that they're all cheats, so you brand him a cheat without any, having any evidence that he's a cheat, without having any knowledge, without having any insight, without having anything. That, to me, is cynicism. And I would fight as much against cynicism as I would against, um, against people who dope. David Walsh, we have to end there. Fascinating stuff. Thank you for being on Hard Talk. Thank you. Thank you very much.